Right. Hello, everyone. Oh. <laughs> so, uh, my name is Phil Wolstenholme. I'm a front end developer at CTI Digital up in Manchester. And um, I'm going to be talking about all the good stuff that Drew Plates brought us in the accessibility area. Um, I'm going to be focusing mainly on stuff that's new in 8 that wasn't in 7. But I'm also going to be talking about some of the stuff that minor releases have brought in. Um, and also talking about future directions for Drupal as a whole with accessibility. Um, there's been a, like a, a wide raft of changes that came in with Drupal 8, uh, which is sort of tied in with the whole idea of, of Drupal 8 being a, a step change in um, like professionalism and higher standards for Drupal. And the place where, as a front-end developer, this was probably most obvious to me before I started looking into accessibility was the front end with the move to Twig. So Drupal 8 saw a bit of like a front end spruce up and we had to change all of our templates from PHP template to Twig and in doing so that gave us a really good chance to review everything and to look at the markup that the platform was providing and make sure it was accessible. Um, obviously, the, the change in templates and engine didn't bring accessibility, to the, uh, accessibility benefits by itself because the rendered HTML is still rendered HTML, but it's a really good chance to review. And we saw um, changes in all sorts of areas, so obvious ones were uh, increasing the color contrast in all the base themes to make sure that was up to scratch. Uh, and those things are sort of quite obvious mistakes, like if something's hard to read, you know it straight away. If it's difficult to read on your phone in bright sunlight, you recognize that. But they're also um, more sort of structural and, and under the hood changes. And an area which had a lot of those was forms. And forms are something that it's quite easy to get wrong in accessibility. Um, but when you know what to look for and what to fix, they're not hugely challenging things to, to change for the better. And one thing we did was look at all the places where forms were being output and made sure that for every field there was a corresponding label. And we had quite a few of these orphan labels, and they were places where an input was being described somewhere on the page, uh, and whoever wrote that had, um, with the best intentions, used a label element because they thought it was a label, which is, is right, but they were only halfway there because they hadn't used the for attribute to link the label to the actual input field. And what that means is when the page is being parsed um, by like a screen reader or some other bit of assistive technology, it can't map a relationship between the form field and the text that describes it. For like a sighted user, that's obvious because there's this visual and spatial relationship between the two things. But for a program, obviously, there's, there's no way. Uh, and the flip side of that was there are inputs that didn't have labels, which is just bad. So in those cases, they were given labels. <laughs> I, uh, another, um, another change was a simple one, but you know the, the red asterisk that signifies that a field's required? That was actually moved in Drupal 8 from sort of regular text content to being CSS generated content, which is where you use like the colon and then you write after and then you have the content actually stored in the CSS file itself. And the reason that was done is because um, CSS generated content generally isn't accessible and not all screen readers would announce it to the user. So often, that's a pitfall. Um, you shouldn't really have your content in CSS content because it isn't accessible. But in this case, we actually wanted the asterisk to not be read out because if you had a very long form and each field is required, that asterisk symbol will be read out over and over and over again. So what we did was we moved it to somewhere that normally stores sort of presentation and styling information. And instead, we used um, the HTML5 required attribute on the field and the area required attribute on the field to signify to assistive technology that it was required, uh, whereas the red asterisk was kept in the CSS for sighted users. Another thing that um, Drew Play did from the markup side of things was to use a lot more semantic HTML. So when Drupal 7 came out, we were using XHTML and we had a limited amount of elements. So we basically just used divs for everything. So everything was a div um, and there was no implicit meaning in that. So what I mean by that is HTML5 brought in all these new section elements. So we had like section, we had nav for navigation, we had a side for things like sidebars that have like a complementary role to play rather than being actual main content. We had footer, which is like an obvious thing for design. 
And these, are, these elements um, have like, implied meaning to screen readers. I'm going to show a demo next using VoiceOver, which is the Mac OS and iOS screen reader. And we're going to show a feature called the Web Rotor. And this is something that's got equivalents in like, most screen readers. And it's a way for users to jump to different bits of the page without having to tap through everything. So you can jump to all the sections, sorry, all the headings on a page, all the links, or you can use this concept of landmarks. And landmarks are driven partly by area attributes, which we're going to talk about later, but also by the implied meanings of, say, a section or a main or a nav element. So this is going to talk a lot, um, relatively quickly, uh, but if we listen, and I'll explain sort of as we go what's going on, hopefully. So we're going to get into the page. This is the rotor. So it's showing all the links on the page, all the headings on the page. And we're going to skip through two now. Not interested in forms at this point, nor web spots. But it's these landmarks that come from the new HTML5 elements. User account, main navigation. Main navigation, navigation. So if we're interested in just the page content, rather than have to tab through all the navigation and have the same links read out to us on every page, we can get straight into the main content. And if we realize we're on the wrong page, we can jump straight to the pagination. So user of these HTML5 elements basically create shortcuts which screen reader or other assistive technology users can use to quickly get an idea of what's available on the page and also to jump around on it. This is the title of an uh, imaginatively named issue queue uh, ticket on Drupal.org. It's called Freedom for Field Sets Along with the Details. And what this is in relation to is an area where Drupal 7 was using the wrong type of HTML and the wrong type of HTML element. We were using field sets a lot to group things together, but purely for cosmetic reasons, it was to create those expanding and contracting field sets that you see, um, say, on like a node edit form. And it was a, a bit of like a, a bit of a hack because these things are meant to group really strongly related fields together. So if you were ordering a pizza, uh, your toppings fields, like all your checkboxes or radio buttons, they would want to be in a field set. But we were using it to group things that had like a vague relationship rather than like a really strong one. So in Drupal 8, uh, in the run-up to Drupal 8, there was an idea that we'd move all these things from field sets to divs. Um, and then we just had some JavaScript to make these divs open and close. But someone uh, was keeping a close eye on the HTML5 specs and found there was actually a new element called the details element, um, which we can potentially see here, depending on how good the projector is. So, details is teamed up with summary. Um, and what it does is it just creates this sort of like accordion effect for you. But it's all native and handled by the browser. So, rather than try and reinvent the wheel and use something like jQuery UI for an accordion, then you have to worry about the tab management of it, like whether it has good focus styles, all that sort of thing. This is all done by the browser. So this is what it looks like unstyled, um, just very basic. But all of that is just coming from those lines there. Um, so it's a really like, easy and simple thing to do. But the benefit is that you don't have to worry about the sort of accessibility side of it. So I can open and close it with the keyboard. I can tab between them. And this is just to show that it is quite customizable as well. So you have like silly emoji things that change when you open and close it if you wanted. Um, and again, that's still pretty basic code, just the detail there is in the classes for styling. So we've switched out um, places where we, we're using field sets in the wrong way to, um, to use these detailed ones, but we've kept using field sets where we should be using them. So for multiple choice questions in forms, um, for grouping together the advanced search settings, we're still using field sets as we should be. Um, and this is available in everything except IE and Edge. And it's available through the field group contrib module and also through the form API. So you don't really have to do anything special to get these features. They're just there in Drupal 8 for you. So 
So, another area where uh, Drew Plate's got stuff that was never in Seven, or at least not in Seven without contract, uh, is WI Area. So this stands for Web Accessibility Initiatives Accessible Rich Internet Applications. It doesn't really describe what it does, but at least it's relatively easy to pronounce. Um, and the whole purpose of these attributes is to provide information to the accessibility API of a browser um, for things that wouldn't normally provide that information. So this is often used for custom UI elements. So if you have um, like a jQuery UI autocomplete in Drupal 8, it uses a lot of WI area attributes to communicate to the assistive technology what's going on. Like this is about to pop something out. This has got like five options available to choose from. And these were around in the time of Drupal 7, but it wasn't a mature enough standard. And also they weren't valid at XHTML, so they couldn't really be used in G7. But with Drupal X switch into HTML5, it's, it's fine to use them. Uh, indeed, they're used quite widely. Um, they're involved in landmarks, which is the stuff we looked about with the voiceover rotor. The advantage of using the new HTML5 elements and the area attributes together is that sometimes users will have assistive technology that understands one or the other, or they'll have a browser that understands one or the other. So there's some duplication in giving a main element a role of main, um, but it's just a good idea for compatibility, really, and that's what we see in the core themes. We also get uh, quite a lot of goodies from Form API, and um, so invalid things uh, are marked barrier invalid, and that means that assistive technology would highlight those to the user as something that isn't acceptable and needs to be worked on. Um, required fields are also highlighted in a similar way. And views uses area sort to describe how tables of data are arranged. Um, and also, form API uses area described by, so that if you are tapping through a form with a screen reader, not only do you have the label announced, but you also have the description announced as well. So it's clear what belongs to what, and there's hopefully a lot of context for each field, depending on how well it's described. And this is another thing where uh, you don't really have to think about it. Like if, you, if you're using Form API in your custom work, it'll just do it for you, which is great. So Drupal 8 had this idea of, of getting off the island and also the concept of things being proudly invented elsewhere. And that was the idea that we didn't have to do everything ourselves anymore. We didn't have to write like a custom modal window plugin. We didn't have to have our own custom autocomplete plugin. And we brought in things from other projects, like other open source projects. Um, one of those was CK Editor, which is now available in Core. So it's a WYSIWYG text editor. Um, and it was actually brought into Core with the um, sort of requirement that accessibility issues with it were, were resolved. So we said, we want to use your product, but there's some things we don't like about it. Let's work together to fix them, and then we can use it. And indeed, um, like Drupal contributors worked with the CK Editor team, and also some developers from IBM to improve the accessibility of not only just CK Editor's interface, but the content it produces. So um, Drupal 8 brought in a change where image fields are required to have an, an alt tag by default. So if you're uploading an image, the <coughs> assumption is that you want your CMS editors to describe it in a way that's accessible. Um, and for a while, images that were inserted for CK Editor didn't have the same requirement for an alt tag, but then that was brought in um, for Drupal 8 as well. And we've also allowed people to use headings with CK Editor. So headings are vital in, in structuring a page in a way that things like that voiceover wrote that can understand. Uh, whereas formerly the default text filter stripped them out, but now it doesn't, which is good. Another really exciting thing is this um, alley, which is a numeronym, so it stands for accessibility, so it begins with A, ends in Y, it's got 11 characters in between. So there's this uh, alley checker plugin, which is made by CK Source, who are the people behind CK Editor and the sort of commercial arm of, that, of it. And they used to charge people for this plugin. Um, but last May uh, on World Accessibility Awareness Day, they actually made it open source. So now it's free for anyone to use. Um, and what it is, is it's kind of like, if you think about a spell checker or that like clippy thing that Microsoft Office used to have, it's kind of a combination of those, but for content produced with CK Editor. So if your CMS users are going in and they're um, making the images not have alt tags and they're putting two links next to each other that link to the same place but aren't merged, which would be annoying if you're having it read out because you'd have the same link read out twice. It will, when you click on it, it will scan through your content, it will find all the issues with it, and it will not only point them out to you, but it will also suggest how to fix them, or in some cases you can click a button and it will fix them for you. Uh, and there's actually an issue to have this in core. 
Um, it's going to happen at some point, and there's just some performance implications of bundling all this extra JavaScript. So that's cool. Um, views was also something that wasn't in D7 core, but now is. And it's an area where there's been a lot of improvements, and they've had quite a substantial impact because because views even is used for a lot of the admin listings. So if you make views more accessible, you make the output of it for site builders better, but also you make the administration interface of Drupal itself more accessible. The main area where this was um, improved on was tables. So views can output tabular data, uh, and now it supports um, letting the users type in a caption and a summary. And the benefit of that is um, for a user using their system technology to navigate a table, it can be quite time consuming and challenging. So the summary and the caption let them know whether or not they want to engage with the table before they get stuck into using it. Um, there's also some improvements around column headers, which improves how the table's data is read out to people. And that's also been expanded now to add row headers as well for people who are creating like, really complicated tables. The next thing is, is something I've sort of touched on earlier is um, Views used to use CTools for its modal. So it was our sort of custom like Drupal-centric thing. But now it's using jQuery UI, which has the benefit of a lot more people working on it, a lot more people testing it. Um, and jQuery UI is another thing which we brought into core. So uh, jQuery UI is used for our modal windows, and it's used for our entity autocomplete. So if you're tagging something or you're using an entity reference field. And it's a similar story as to a Seek editor. We, we brought it into core, but with the provision that it had to be super accessible, and we worked to, to make it better. So the message behind this for developers really is to sort of think before you use like a custom lightbox module or think before you bring in something from Bower or NPM because there might be something that does that already for you in jQuery UI, which is easy to use in core and it's now um, the encouraging to do. There's also this new modal and dialogue API, which we don't really have time to go into, but that's really cool. We're launching Drupal content in a modal and that uses jQuery UI. Um, but this is, this is something that isn't probably invented elsewhere. This is something called Drupal Announce, which is really cool. And we've got a demo of it coming up. And it's basically almost like a text-to-speech API. So it's powered by um, ARIA attributes, which we talked about earlier. And it's powered by the ARIA Live attribute. And what ARIA Live does is it says to the assistive technology, this is a part of the page that's likely to change. And if it changes, I'd like you to announce that. So we can use that for things like a news feed, which might have live news coming in or maybe like a live sports feed or a Twitter feed. And it's basically used to announce changes which are initiated without a page reload, and which would be obvious to a sighted user because something would pop up at the bottom or the top of the page, but might not otherwise be obvious. And Drupal Announce isn't sort of hugely sophisticated. It's doing what you could do with just HTML um, in this area live region. But the benefit of it for us is it's consistent. So Core uses it, Contrib can use it. And it also handles queuing. So if you have two things sending a message very close to each other, the messages will be combined and they'll be read out rather than one be cut off as the other one comes in. So if you don't, if you're not like super familiar with using the screen reader, it can be difficult to test. But there's this devel, devel alley module. And what that does is it logs the announcements to the console. So if I was to um, stick this JavaScript into my console to announce that there's like X items added to the feed, that would be read out to me if I had my screen reader open. Um, but if I didn't, I could see it as a JavaScript console message. So it's useful for testing. I'm going to see an example now of, um, of Drupal Announce, or at least something similar to it in jQuery UI, being used, out, being used to read out um, an autocomplete field. So this has got loads of develop generate content in, so it's going to read some stuff in Latin. But what we're looking to do is find Amsterdam. Um, so we're going to start typing in this field, and we should here eventually. For example, Amsterdam. thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we're having the text fields um, description read out to us, uh, and also some extra information from Mario attributes. So if we play that again, we're going to start typing. But um, so these are the initial ones. But if we imagine we can't see, 
Amsterdam's not there, so we'll type some more. There's one result. That's what we want. And then we're on to the next field. So that's how you can use a like dynamic JavaScript based UI element. I haven't run out to you. And then you can do, or rather you can look at the uh, contextual links module, which has got loads of good examples of not only Drupal and Alps, but also the Drupal 8 tab management. And this is another new thing in the Drupal 8 JavaScript API. And what this is used for is restricting keyboard navigation through tabbing. So if your users have a task where they only need to tap to particular bits of the page, and they don't want to go through every focusable element, so like every link, every form field, you can actually pass a jQuery selector to this tab management API, and then it will restrict their tabbing. So an example of this is with the um, contextual links module. So I've enabled uh, Devel Alley, and it's highlighting all the areas where tabbing has been constrained to. So what we're going to do is we're going to try and use the contextual links and you'll notice how it skips all of the things like the navigation. To select or deselect this checkbox, press control, option, space. Tally is constrained to a set of 19 contextual links of the edit mode toggle. Press the ESCP to exit. Open user account menu configuration options. Toggle button navigation user account menu free items. You are currently on a toggle button. To select open configuration options, toggle button manager one night. Open main navigation configuration options. Open configuration options. Toggle button. So we can jump just between the contextual links without having to go through all the menu, all of the sidebar stuff, and so on. Um, so this is useful when you have, like, when the user's chosen to do a particular thing. So they might have chosen to launch a login form in a modal window. Uh, they might have expanded a slide-out menu, and then you'd want to restrict the tab in just to the menu, and that you'd want to unconstrain it once the menu is closed. Um, and it's really easy to do. Uh, you set up a tab in context. And then you um, call the tabbing manager with a jQuery, well, jQuery selector. And then later on, you release it using the deactivate method. Um, yeah, so that's some, some, J, some JavaScript goodness. We then have inline form errors. And this has been like going on forever. So in 2009, someone raised an issue. And they said, when I fill in a form incorrectly, the only way at a field level that the error is communicated to me is a red border. So at the top of the form in the messages region, you'd see like uh, first name is a required field. But when you actually got down to that field, the only thing that's communicating that uh, in value state would be a red border, which is, is no good if you're not a sighted user or if you're colorblind. So there was a lot of discussion on that. And then in 2012, the idea of showing inline form errors was proposed. So this is um, showing the errors not at the top of the page, but above the field. And this issue like, ran all the way through to 2016. Um, so we built up some momentum about inline form errors, and it was going to be included in core. And then it wasn't quite there yet, so there's just too many varieties of forms that, that Drupal can produce. And there were some, some issues where the messages wouldn't be displayed at all, rather than above the form. So it was included as an experimental module but with the sort of demand or guidelines that we had to meet stability requirements earlier this year, otherwise it wouldn't be included at all. And those, um, those stability requirements were met. There was like a last minute effort to, to get it all sorted. And it's a really good module because it, it meets like current best practice about um, form errors, which we haven't had in Drupal at all. And so we're now showing errors in context, which is really good when you're sort of partway through a massive form on your phone. You have to keep scrolling to the top to see what's gone wrong. So this is an example of errors previously. Um, so I haven't specified an authored on date, and I haven't specified a title. And this is a pretty basic page, so it's kind of easy to see what's going on. Um, but imagine if that was on a smaller uh, device, or it was a much more complicated form. The errors are shown at the top, um, but apart from the red outline, there's not much going on elsewhere on the form. But if we install inline form errors, we can see we still have a message at the top, but it's now an improved message. It's, it's linking us to the fields which have the problems. So authored on and title are links there. And then underneath title and underneath authored on, we have the more specific error messages. So it's much more easy to see at a glance um, where the problems are. 
So that's stuff that Drupal 8 has given us. Um, what's next? There's a, a lot more work to be done. Um, like accessibility is something that's it's not like something you do and then you've done it. It's an ongoing process. Um, and the areas where there's work and excitement in, in Drupal 8 currently is for more JavaScript testing. So now, as well as the PHP tests uh, on Drupal.org, we can run JavaScript tests. And that's going to be really useful for finding the things that are quite laborious to test otherwise. So in, um, in Drupal 8, we've had quite a lot of regressions around keyboard navigation. So I was talking earlier about the, the markup cleaning. And as part of that, we took a lot of IDs out of our CSS. Um, IDs aren't a good thing to have CSS because they're super specific. So there was a move to, to get rid of them. And uh, someone accidentally not only removed the IDs from the CSS, but they thought, hey, now we're not using these for styling. We can get rid of them in the markup if they're not being used by JavaScript. Um, but they were being used for um, some JavaScript around keyboard navigation. So we were finding that you, can now, you couldn't um, open like, drop-down menus in some places with your keyboard. But if we had JavaScript testing to simulate a user pressing tab, 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 spacebar, we'd be able to see whether or not the pages um, with interactive elements were working as they should be. Another area which is interesting is using third-party testing tools. So there's one called Tenon, which is tenon.io. Um, and there's also an open source similar thing called Quail, uh, which was um, worked on by some people related to Drupal, but there's kind of been a slowdown in its development recently, which is why I haven't mentioned it in the slides. Um, another area is Windows High Contrast Mode. So this is something that's really, really popular um, by actual users, but it doesn't really get a huge amount of attention from developers. Um, so that's something that we're looking to improve in Drupal at the moment. And then the final thing, which I think is really, really cool, and there's a video um, which we're going to look at next. We can actually now, in Safari at least, um, choose whether or not to display animations to a user based on their system level preferences. So Safari's launched basically a media query for people who are sensitive to motion. So in your um, like Mac OS settings, there's an accessibility tab, and you can choose to reduce the amount of animations that are shown. So on a computer, this would mean that your dock menu doesn't sort of massively expand. But it's also accessible to websites. Um, and this is a video made by um, a CSS Tricks contributor. Um, and this bit on the left um, is a like, really crazy animation. So if anyone's like feeling queasy or is motion sensitive, you probably wouldn't want to look at that. But on the right hand side, we've got our system preferences. And we'll go into the accessibility settings and we'll see how uh, the content on the web page can be transformed. So there's your sort of like uh, animation. And then we open up our accessibility preferences. And there's this reduce motion option. And then the Java, well, the CSS even, uh, is picking that system preference up. And it's showing sort of more simplified content. So we could use that to sort of disable parallax scrolling effects, to like prevent videos from playing in the background of content, um, which would make the content a lot more accessible. Yeah. Uh, Windows High Contrast mode we covered earlier because I wanted to save the video till last. So that's it. Thank you very much, everyone. Does anyone have any questions? Which I'll try and answer. Yeah? Um, thanks, Dad. Thank you. Um, to somebody that has uh, done a lot of web design and not thought too much about how to make things accessible, um, are there any kind of resources you can point, point to? Yeah. To start here, what, what can we take away today? So there's a phenomenal resource called WebAIM, which comes out of a university in the States. Um, and this is like a brilliant resource for like, everything to do with accessibility, basically. And it's not too technical either, so um, it's easy to sort of follow the wrong links and end up on like a spec or like really technical documentation, but this isn't like that at all. Um, so WebAIM, I'd recommend. And also um, to sort of have a play around with a screen reader, so like download Chromevox or learn like the right keys to use for VoiceOver if you've got a Mac. Um, there's a bit of a learning curve to get started with them. Like there's lots of keyboard shortcuts which aren't immediately obvious. 
But once you've played around with them a bit, it's really interesting to see like, how content's read out and how making small changes affects that. Uh, also, another good thing is the Wave toolbar, which is a more technical resource, but it um, is shown in line with your content and it highlights how it's free. Hi. Hi. Um, <coughs> today, if you build a site in Drupal 8, let's say for a, for a compound publisher kind of site or university site, uh, how much accessibility work did you have to do to get the site uh, passing the required um, accessibility requirements? Uh, yeah. Only a while, I, I forgot the name of this one, it's like lightweight. And yeah, so there's WPEG. Uh, a, 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 and A, A, A. Triple A is, is seen as a standard to aspire to, but something that it would be very, very difficult to reach, um, whereas double A is, is more obtainable. Um, but the interesting thing with that question is, if you use Drupal with minimal modifications, it would be easy to meet the technical requirements, but the issue would come from your content. <coughs> so quite a lot of... Um, Accessibility issues are, are caused by people inputting content which is malformed, so it doesn't have the right heading structure, or they might try and change the colour of things. <coughs> and Drupal actually did some stuff to change that. So it got involved with something called WCAG, uh, which is yet yeah, another acronym. But what that's about is not just making sure that your CMS is usable um, with assistive technology for visitors, but also for content editors. So if you employ, if you're in a big organisation, there'll be people in, in your organisation who might have a role in running the website, who might appreciate that sort of thing. And it's also aiming to encourage people to produce accessible content, which is similar to that thing with the plugin that I spoke about, which looks for errors. So it, I would definitely install that and try and also um, instill awareness of accessibility in your CMS editors and administrators. <coughs> So they're aware of what they should and shouldn't be doing and are comfortable with the ideas of that. But in terms of <coughs> technical accessibility, it would depend on how much you extend Drupal. Um, so it depends on like what custom work you do, like how adventurous your navigation systems get and that sort of thing. Um, but common pitfalls are headings, uh, images not having uh, alt tags and forms that aren't navigable. So if you get like the basics right, you're doing a good start and you have more time to look at the more sort of sophisticated aspects. Have you had experience working with RMIB? No, actually, I haven't. But they, they have quite a lot of resources on their website, so I should have mentioned that earlier. RMIB yeah. and other charities do a lot of work. Previously, it used to be a free service to monthly charge for it. Oh. But you could actually, as an institution, take your site to them. And yeah, and they're all the same. That sounds good. Um, if you had a budget for it, that would be a really good thing to do because it's quite hard to test accessibility. Yeah. Um, you need sort of quite a wide amount of knowledge to be able to do it in depth rather than just running through the same tools that everyone else uses. Anyone else? Um, oh, yeah. Anything else? So you mentioned standards for like meeting A, not Have you found that actually in real life means that even if you hit like the double A, Um, not always, and actually we had an example of this uh, on Friday, um, I was at work and we've, we've just, like in the last few weeks of a project been asked to change the whole way the navigation works, and it's been like crazy, um, and someone came back to us, actually the client did, they had some in-house developers and they'd said like with this navigation, couldn't you put like area has pop up here, which is an area attribute that says clicking on this will expand something else. And I was like, yeah, that's a good idea. We definitely could have done that. But when we'd been testing it with voiceover ourselves and with people navigation, it had been working fine. So there's always things that you can be doing. But I guess if you write good HTML, it should be usable in some way already. So would you recommend people maybe try to use voiceover at least to kind of like have like developers, you know, refresh page, refresh page, refresh page, refresh page. in a simple way, should develop the videos and start maybe adopting voice recognition more often? It depends on the project, I suppose. Yeah. Um, I mean, ideally, obviously, the answer would be yes. 
but that would be like time consuming and it might be something that QA would do instead. Um, so it's something that I would encourage and it's an interesting thing to do. I'm not sure if you could like force it on everyone. <laughs> Maybe you should, I don't know. Anyone else? Alright then, thank you very much. Alright, I'll be around.